Well, again, uh, thank you for hey. thank you for joining us. We're just so honored to, and privileged to have a such an amazing guest. Um, uh, what's it been like oh, for you the past you. several years, or what's it been uh, like for you thank recently? You for me. Yeah. Well, uh, how, how's it been for you? What's what's you've been amazingly busy? It seems. Yeah, it's been a it's been a crazy last couple of years. I'd say that since my move to Los Angeles, which was three years ago uh, in January, I'd say that um, my career started to pick up and things started to change. And yeah, so I've been doing a lot of traveling and um, a lot of releases. But it's nice to have a slower time, a little bit forced slow time right now during lockdown. But yeah, it's been it's been interesting, but uh, it's good to take a breather after three years of kind of running full tilts. Yeah. So again, you were born in um, Philadelphia. You grew up there. Yes. Yes. Grew up in Philadelphia. Yeah, it's a great town. Anything, and then after that, you went to um, London. Yes. Yes, I moved to London when I was eighteen for college. Okay. Um, yeah, and I spent four and a half amazing years there. So I kind of feel like I grew up in Philadelphia, but I feel like London kind of raised me. That's where I kind of became a woman, as it were. So I'm really grateful for that time, too. Did you ever pick up the accent or anything like that? <laughs> you know, I didn't. I I fought really hard not to pick the accent up because uh, I, I was just proud of, of who I was and I wanted to keep my accent. But um, I did sort of... I feel like my accent softened. I definitely still sound American, but I don't sound as Philly. Uh, but the the weird thing I picked up was the slang. I oh. think I use British slang all the time, and I think it sounds very weird coming out of my very American mouth. <laughs> but uh, it kind of throws people sometimes, but I can't help it. Especially there's a couple things that are just like shorter uh, in British slang than they are in American slang, like the word lift. Or the word flat. It's just like, oh, why, why wouldn't I just say flat instead of apartment? It's a couple less syllables. <laughs> it just comes out a little easier. Well, any other phrases you've learned there? Or? Oh, yeah. Oh, so many. Um, so my roommate, actually, who I'm quarantining with, she and I met in grad school in London. And so it's just a back and forth of British phrases with two Americans all the time. And the one that we say constantly every day is the word posh. I think we just don't really have that same slang term here in the States that means that same thing. So we say posh all the time. What, what does that mean? It's like fancy, oh, okay. I guess. Yeah, it's like fancy, but um, it's, but you can kind of, it's you can kind of use it in a fun way, like uh, we'll get some sort of, you know, nice wine or something, uh, and one of us will look at the other and be like, ooh, posh. <laughs> oh, that sounds cool. Uh, it's just become our little catchphrase, I feel like, during... during well, she was my favorite Spice Girl. Right? <laughs> She's married to David Beckham, it doesn't get better, right? <laughs> uh, it, it seems, um, reading that uh, a lot of your songwriting was inspired in London, or is that is that where you maybe found your writing voice, or...? Yeah, before I moved to London, I actually had no desire to be a singer-songwriter. I had never written a song in my life. I never really thought about it. Um, so it's definitely something that I discovered there. Uh, and so I was very inspired by the other writers that were around me and the music that was around me at the time. And that really uh, gave birth, I guess, to my to my writing style. How's the process work for you? Do you... Do you um come up with the lyrics first or is there a music play in your head or or where do you find inspiration for writing yeah you know it kind of depends on the day um i do a lot of co-writing so i go into the studio sort of more or less every day five days a week with other writers that i know with um, my own project and then obviously other people's projects and, and stuff like that um so I think, you know, I often come in with ideas, and so my writing often starts in the shower in the morning after my workout, just sort of humming to yourself, and then you think, oh, that's kind of cool, and I will admit that there have been a number of times that a, a wet hand has sort of reached out of the shower door, and is like <laughs> hitting things around, looking for my phone, like trying not to get my phone wet, and like singing into the, to the voice recorder, like, ah. <laughs> uh, 
And now that we're home, um, my roommate is definitely getting to experience some of that, the, the clanging and shouting from the, <laughs> from various parts of the, from various parts of the house. So. So do you keep yeah, a, a recorder with you all the time? Then? Do you keep a recorder with oh, you all I'm the sorry. time? I'm sorry. Do you keep a recorder yeah, with you all the time? Or a notepad? Most or... of the time I just use my phone. But I also, yeah, I, I keep a little tiny notebook on me all the time. I've got a big one with me right here on my desk. But I tend to use um, field notes notebooks. They're, they're maybe, you know, yay big. Um, perfect stocking stuffer, as my mom always says. And, uh, yeah, I just carry those around. There's one in my purse. There's one in, like, my little tiny going out bag. There's one in every suitcase that I own, just so that I always have something to write. Ain't there any songs that have been inspired by like a dream or have you just w woken up and written down something that's become a song or? You know, it is funny that you bring that up. Uh, I just wrote a song um, during quarantine that, uh, it was that, it was exactly that. I woke up in the morning and I heard this melody. Um, it was just this, um, and the song is actually coming out um, sooner than later. That's all I'll say about it. But um, it's it's so funny, yeah, that you mentioned that. It had never really happened to me before, um, and it just happened two weeks ago. And now, and the song's coming out really quickly. So wow, that's very exciting. Oh. So they say you you sing sort of an atmospheric music, and I, I think that's how they described it. But yet you seem so different from your songs uh, very <laughs> yeah. Upbeat and happy. Yeah, I get yeah i get that all the time i get that all the time i definitely channel any sort of um you know big emotions big feelings that i'm having into my work and i think i don't know i would say i, I think a lot of artists feel this way but then you get that outlet and then you just feel better in your in your regular life because you got to channel your aggression or your sadness or whatever it was into the song and so then you leave that at the studio and you walk out into the california sunshine and you feel great where do you record at well a bunch of different places a lot of people in la have home studios but obviously during quarantine i'm in my home studio so this is my home studio it's a lofted little office that is above my living space so it's our little second floor we usually use it as a guest room because i'm often in other people's studios or at any of the studios here in los angeles but yeah so this desk uh has been where the magic is happening right. during Whoa. this time yeah and what's crazy is i've started recording myself for the first time ever on this little microphone here i can kind of lean it down oh it's not going to lean down for me but anyway there's a microphone right here um <laughs> and that's uh sort of my first experience of being my own engineer which has been a learning curve for sure but i have a lot of great friends who have been helping me out and now some of those vocals are going to come out they're going to come out on my own record and then this new song i have coming out uh i recorded it all myself so definitely feels like an exciting moment so you do all most of the instruments or how, how does it work Actually, no. I so I play three instruments. Um, as I said on a uh, on a live last week, I play three instruments, all of them very badly. Uh, so I'm more of a songwriter style musician. It's just kind of strumming on guitar and what my manager refers to as T Rex hands when I'm playing piano. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm the sort of person that can get the thought across with my instruments. And obviously I'll write the melodies and the lyrics. I'll give you the chords, but uh, I have so many friends that are incredible musicians and incredible producers. So they can sort of help me to fill out the world of the sound, uh, which I love doing. I really like working collaboratively because then there, it definitely helps you to take your ego out of a song that you're writing. And someone says, Hey, you know what? Did you think about maybe changing this lyric or this little thing? And then, you realize that you know maybe you don't have all of the most incredible ideas that it's going to make this song a hit. That maybe uh, you need a little help sometimes. So that's been a really fun thing to learn over the years. I love your acoustic work. Do you just love just the voice and just the purity of the singing? Oh, thank you. Yeah, I. That's often where I feel my most comfortable, for sure. Um, because I started in classical music in terms of my vocal training. 
So, well, first I did musical theater in high school. I went to theater camp, did the whole thing. All right. Uh, and then, um, yeah, in college, I was doing a lot of opera, stuff like that. So there's really this um, integrity to the sound that they teach you. And they want you to just sort of know your voice in and out a cappella, just the way that it moves in an acoustic room. Or, you know, a lot of times people learn to sing at church. And then there's like, you know, the beautiful acoustics in that room. And you just get to learn the ins and outs of your voice and how to throw it and how to pull it back. And so, yeah, performing acoustic is always... Uh, a little bit easier and a bit more homey for me than anything else. When did you know you wanted to be an entertainer or a singer? Did, did it work out you want to be an entertainer or a singer or, or, or did you... Yeah, when I was a kid, uh, I wanted to be an actress. That was the big thing because I was doing all this musical theater. I wanted to be on Broadway. Um, but I'm actually a pretty horrible dancer. Uh, so <laughs> Broadway really wasn't in the cards for me. So, yeah, I, I had planned on becoming a politician, actually, and that's a form of entertainer, I suppose, in a way, uh, if you're looking at it in a dark way. But, um, yeah, I wanted to be a politician and a lawyer, uh, and that's kind of what I went to school in mind to do. But, but while I was in school, music sort of just uh, grabbed me <laughs> by the hand and was like, actually, wait, maybe this is something that you love. And um, I had never thought about writing a song or anything, but yeah, I guess I thought when I was a child that I always wanted to be an entertainer, but I never really thought it was going to work out, I guess. And oddly enough, it did. So when was your like first big break? Because I know you've been on like a lot of like TV shows and promos, especially like the UFC promos. That's how I first found you. But like, how did they first discover you? And like, what was that like? Well, in terms of the TV stuff, the first show that I ever was a part of was Lucifer on Fox, and now it's on Netflix. Uh, that was my first ever song placement, and I was so excited, uh, especially because Lucifer is actually based off of a character from a comic book called The Sandman, written by Neil Gaiman, and I really love Neil Gaiman, and I love his work, so I was super excited just to be a part of that show, and now five seasons later, I've done... I think 10 songs for them. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's been a really fruitful. Or, Sorry, what did you say? Or, or like, how did they first get a, get in touch with you? What was that like? Or how did they do that? How did they find uh, so you? That was through my publisher, actually. Um, my publisher had just signed me and they just kind of put my music out there. And I think they thought that it would be right for the show. So yeah, they sent it over and uh, they loved it. And it worked nice. out. That's awesome. And what about your other shows, like uh, Riverdale? I mean, what was it like being done? <laughs> really incredibly popular shows? Oh, it's awesome. It's the best. I think there is nothing cooler than seeing how someone else uses your song in a show, how they view your song put to picture. Because uh, I can make my own music videos, and that's great, but there's something really special about seeing your song in, through somebody else's eyes in this different world that you never even dreamed of. So yeah, it's been really special and, and the fans of those shows obviously are amazing and my roommate loves Riverdale, obsessed. So she's <laughs> beside herself every time we have had a placement with them and it's just been so much fun. It's been wonderful. Wow, that's amazing. And then I also seen like America's Got Talent and stuff like that. Yeah, that was a cool one as well. Um, a bunch, yeah, the, we've had so many. I mean, Grey's Anatomy was really awesome. I've done a couple things for them, and that's been really exciting. Um, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina was one of my favorites on Netflix, too. That was really good. Um, amazing. I've just been really lucky. It's been so, so great. So just after that first initial Lucifer um, TV show you're on, then it just started snowballing in from there? Yeah, I think, um, obviously, I have an amazing team over at my publisher, and they're the ones that actually sort of pitch these songs and work with the music supervisors to find the right song for a scene and, and make sure that everything is squared away with, you know, paperwork and all this other stuff. 
so they're really incredible. I sit over here and I create the songs all day, but they're the ones that really make sure that uh, they shine out there in the world. And, and so I definitely have to, to give them credit where credit is due. I'm really, really lucky to have that. And this is the question I really want to know. I'm a huge <laughs> UFC fan. And this is how I first discovered you because you were on like the biggest fight. First, I never knew at the time, but I never knew you did the Conor McGregor and Khabib like promo yeah. video that's crazy that could possibly be like the biggest fight in like history <laughs> yeah it was pretty insane i actually started my uh relationship with the ufc by doing some music for an episode of road to the octagon and uh at the time and this was back in 2018 uh, so I'm from Philadelphia. Philadelphia is, I think, um, a lot of people know it as a fighting town. There's a lot of fighting gyms. People are really into boxing, into UFC, that sort of stuff. Uh, and some, oh, I have a lot of friends that are very into UFC, but it was never really my thing. I think I just didn't get it. And then I ended up doing this song for Road to the Octagon. And I remember watching the episode and just being completely floored by the level of training and athleticism that goes into this sport and how how much there's a family surrounding all of these people their mm -hmm. trainers and, and months and months of work and hype and everything else and then of course also there's this intense media pressure to sort of <laughs> be this certain person and it's it's very uh acting -y. Mm -hmm. there's definitely personalities and you have to be on mm -hmm. and uh yeah, I was so blown away by this like behind the scenes thing that then when they approached for that McGregor Khabib fight, I was like, yeah, absolutely. Um, I was kind of floored that they wanted, especially for that one to use. So we actually did two different promos for them, one that aired that night um, in the stadium and then one that was just sort of the commercial. And both of them, they wanted these sort of beautiful, airy female vocals uh, for this fight. I was like, okay, that's really, really interesting. And I think they wanted to just let these two characters speak for themselves and they wanted to build tension without mm -hmm. it just sort of being the obvious music mm -hmm. choice. So that was really great. And then I got to do another another song for another McGregor fight earlier this year. And that was my right. black cover. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's been an I'm awesome relationship. How difficult was that? Because you're, that's an iconic song and great band. And then now you have to kind of come up with your, a little bit of your own version. Did they tell you which way they want to do it or how you want to do it? Yeah, oddly enough, I created that version for Marvel. Um, I did that version for them for uh, a TV show, a very short-lived TV show that they had called Inhumans. I did that for their pilot. Um, so it was more or less just kind of lying around after after we had done it for, for Marvel and they wanted this rock version, but they wanted it to be dark and female. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. And that was really, really fun to do. Um, but yeah, I think my publisher must have sent it over to USC and said, hey, you know, what do you guys think of this? And, and they were into it. And I was just excited to be a part of another history making fight. How'd you pick the, the style of um, the voice of doing it? Because it seems like there's a very distinct voice you use when you sang that song, or very raw and kind of edgy. And yeah, like do you, yeah. do you go through like, like samples in your head and just test them all out on the mic and just pick and choose, or how does that work? Yeah, I think uh, oftentimes it is definitely that thing in the booth, and it's you and the audio engineer and. They're like, oh, could you try it this way? Could you do it that way? Especially because previously for UFC, I had done very sort of airy, pretty stuff. And then this was way more raw. Um, but a lot of this one had to do with the fact that Marvel just wanted it really raw and they wanted it really dark. And it was kind of, uh, for a certain for some reason we had to do it in that key. I think it was because the music beforehand that had been composed for the show was in a certain key and to flow nicely, we had to we had to place it there and that was quite low in my voice. So that kind of created that raw sound, but I think that one definitely felt like I was inhabiting a character. It was this like Marvel superhero world and that was really fun. I'm glad that it fit really well too for, uh, for the fight. Well, speaking of superheroes and things like that, uh, you got to act and do a little things with the League of Legends. Yeah, that was so that much was, fun. 
That was really great. I got to do their uh, 2019 season start theme song. And then in the fall, when I performed it live in Paris, they sort of aligned me with this character from the game named Camille, who, who is this, is this badass. badass cyborg cop princess. It's tough to describe. She's got a really crazy backstory, um, and I'm probably completely butchering it. But yeah, that was really really fun and it was so cool to inhabit her on stage or just you know at least a little bit and they made a hologram um of me that did some of the things that she did in the original cinematic that obviously i couldn't do like being blown backwards by a bomb uh was not <laughs> to do live on stage so my oh you don't do that at home or just for practice at home yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no Though I did do it um, on the one day, we just uh, we had this big green screen room and all this foam, and they just had me jumping off of these big green steps onto this big green foam and just jumping and jumping. And <laughs> it was great. And then they found the right shot to create the hologram, and and that's what that's what she was made out of. Wow. So did that fulfill your um, the acting bug you had when you were a kid, or was it great to definitely, definitely. It was fun. I think sometimes I feel really nervous when I get on stage uh, to do my live shows because it's just you. You don't really have any armor to protect you. And I think sometimes having a character can really help. And there were millions of people watching live for the broadcast for the League of Legends uh, 2019 World Finals. And I was terrified. But I think coming out and feeling like, this isn't me. This is Camille. Camille can do anything. She's a badass. And so that helped me to sort of throw the armor up and think to myself, oh yeah, I got this, this is easy. How do you get over the, the stage fright, you know, when, when the performers are out there? Because a lot of the songs you do are very personal and, and, and you're exposing yourself, uh, your emotions and everything. How do you get to do that and uh, or get over that stage fright that a lot of people have when they first get on stage? Or You know, I still have not gotten over it. You get over it, I think, once you're up there and you're having fun. But in the moments beforehand, I still feel nervous. I did a live show from my garage the other day on Instagram. Most low pressure thing in the world. And I was nervous. And then I had just done shows in front of, you know, 50,000, 100,000 people last year with Kygo. And I felt the same way in my garage <laughs> before going live on Instagram. It was... Yeah, it never really goes away. I think the key is just once you get out there, realizing that people don't people don't want to see you fail, and uh, people don't want to see anything go wrong. They're there to have fun, and so their energy is very much supporting you, and they're just excited to be there with you. And so once you feel that energy and that wall of positivity hits you, you definitely feel a lot better. But in the moments before, <laughs> it's always a little scary. Oh yeah, and that's another thing. I seen you started working with like Kygo and like Galantis. That's that's awesome. The EDM, you know, industry. Is that is that something you want to get into? Start getting into? Yeah, it's been amazing. I have been been a big fan of EDM music for a really long time. When I was at school in Europe, it was obviously all rage, and I was going to clubs listening to this kind of music every night. My best friend is from college is actually Norwegian, and she introduced me to Kygo many, many years ago. And so I had just been a fan for the longest time. So working together has been really fun. Uh, and Galantis, too. They're such great guys. But I got to go out on tour with Kygo last year, which was really fun. And we just got to perform in front of massive, amazing crowds. And yeah, I think, I think actually we have some more to do together. But that's all I'll that's all I'll say on that front. <laughs> Anybody you've ever dreamed of working with? Uh, any composer or singer or oh, yeah. musician? So many. Um, man, you know the person that comes to mind, I think, because I was just talking about him last night, is Sting. I'm a big Sting fan. I think no one really tells a story quite like Sting, uh, and whether or not he was in the police or in a solo project, so. That would be a dream collab for me. Have you ever met anyone, uh, one of your idols, uh, and performed with them, or, or what was that like with the first idol you worked with or met? Yeah, um, I actually 
so this is an interesting story, especially to told on a podcast. I bonded backstage at a Kygo show with Jimmy Buffett about a podcast that we both love. Wow. And that was one of the coolest moments. Um, so we were playing live in Alabama last summer at Hangout Fest. It's just a gorgeous festival. It's right on the ocean and Gulf Shores. Really fun time. And Jimmy was coming to do a live version, live remix of Margaritaville. Obviously, being in Alabama, people were so excited. I mean, that song is famous everywhere in the world, but I think especially you know, in, in and around Gulf Shores, Key West, all of that stuff, I think people are really, really into that song. So there was all this buzz around him and all this activity, and I thought, oh, you know, I'm not gonna bother Jimmy Buffett. But when the actual show started, we found ourselves standing next to each other, checking our mics backstage, and we started talking about my Kygo song, and um, he was very complimentary, and that was really sweet, and I just said, you know, I just have to tell you, you were on one of my favorite podcasts, uh, My Brother, My Brother and Me. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it, but it's these three brothers, they're comedians, and Jimmy just happens to really love it. And so he went on an episode of it, and his eyes lit up, and we just got to bond over this podcast that we love. So that was probably the coolest thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> we got really excited when you followed uh, my son on, on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that out loud. <laughs> really excited. He's jumping around. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> have, have you ever been excited about or surprised by anyone who's followed you? Yes. Well, first let me say that um, I was floored when I saw your video, Devin. Floored. Um, I sent it to my management and then I sent it to my roommate. We, I was kind of up here working and then I sent it through a text down to her in her office downstairs and she was like, oh my. <laughs> so much skills. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I see what it does next. Um, that's so incredible, really incredible, um, and kind of crazy and dangerous. But also, like I know, obviously, you know what you're doing. You're a pro. <laughs> but to me, it's just so incredibly impressive. So yeah, I just can't wait to see what you do next. But um, people who have followed me, that I got. If you want to incorporate into one of your shows, things. that would be great. If you want fire in one of your shows, <laughs> if you want to incorporate fire in one of your shows, that would be <laughs> awesome. Oh, that would be awesome. That would be really cool. Maybe I'll get the chance. I would love to get the chance to go back to Hawaii. So maybe I'll get to do a show and come up and do some amazing fire dancing. There's a there is a, a proper name. I think in um. Oh yeah, this is called Samoan Fire Knife Dancing. But then I think in the mainland they call it something different, right? It's like the staffs, like contact staffs and stuff like that. Maybe, yeah. I, I you would know better. Than that. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I'm just totally floored by it. So cool. Um, yeah. In terms of someone who followed me that I freaked out, uh, I actually have had the privilege recently of working with Michael Bolton. And when he followed me on Instagram, we had not met yet. Uh, we just had a date in the calendar to work in the studio. And um, I guess he got curious about who I was and followed me on Instagram. And I lost it, <laughs> you know, screaming and yelling through my apartment. My roommate and I freaking out because it's Michael Bolton. When a man loves a woman. <laughs> classic, classic stuff. So, yeah, that was very exciting. You know what I love is um, I love that you um, sort of speak plurally, that um, you always speak about your team, like you're part of a team. And I know people look at you as sort of being the, the, the face of the team, but it uh, seems like you love your team. And how did you get, how did you end up picking your team? Or You know, interestingly enough, I think my team in many ways found me. It's sort of a long story, but my manager ended up being the one to find me. I sort of tripped and fell into an amazing publishing situation. And then my record label, um, I actually am signed to Kygo's JV at RCA. So that came to me through my connection with Kygo. But yeah, I think every artist... I think sometimes people don't realize this, but behind every artist is a village, and mine happens to be particularly great. So uh, I love having that support, and I think that it's something that people don't tend to talk about enough. Obviously, at the end of the day, like I'm out here creating music that I'm, I'm proud of and everything else, but the music wouldn't have the same 
machine behind it if it wasn't for such a great team. Wow, no, that's just... We, 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 I think um, we always want to know, like, uh, when, when you were younger, or did you ever think, ever in your dreams, that you'd be doing this, like, when you were, uh, when you were a kid, or... Yeah, no, I, I think maybe my wildest dreams, but I had never considered being a singer-songwriter, sure. I never thought that I had it in me to write music, so I never would have saw... I never would have seen this coming. If you had come to me even 10 years ago and said that this is what I would be doing, I would have laughed at you, for sure. <laughs> for sure. But it's just been an incredible journey, and I'm really grateful for that. Well, you could have been a lawyer who sang. Absolutely, yes. A singing lawyer, that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, that would be kind of cool. Sort of reminds me of um, that scene in Chicago where he's like singing and tap dancing in the courtroom. Maybe that would have been my vibe, but <laughs> I think this is probably uh, a better better way to incorporate music into my life than, than annoying some judges. By the way, so what was Conor McGregor like? Oh yeah, did you get to meet him or? I, or? No, I didn't. Um, all of the work that I did was just sort of remote, so I, I've never gotten to meet him. Uh, that would be really exciting. Did he, ever send, did he ever send you a note or anything saying great song or just? No, no, nothing like that. I think send you a proper I twelve body. Team at UFC that was choosing music is my guess. I don't know. I don't think that. Um, I don't know. Maybe he was involved. Now I'm like, ooh, <laughs> Conor McGregor in my music. That's exciting. But uh, check your Instagram yeah, followers. I think that would be really cool. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> maybe after this. So I seen you started like a new um, on your Instagram, like some kind of wine wine tasting with you or wine mixer. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Or? Yeah. So I've been doing these Friday live streams. Actually, today I'm I'm taking a week off, but I decided at the beginning of the sort of coronavirus lockdown that I wanted to do a happy hour with with my followers just to have some time together and hang out. So I've had a couple of wineries come on and talk about their wines and their products. I have Seedlip come on. They make non-alcoholic spirits, which is always great to have around, especially during a time like this when you want a cocktail, but you think, oh, I had a cocktail every other night this week. Maybe maybe not. Seedlip's amazing for that. Uh, and then I've had some friends on just to talk about music and their relationship between music and a well-crafted cocktail and music and a good wine. So we're going to keep that going throughout coronavirus. I think just it's nice to have a distraction at times like these. Well, thank you so much and uh, great luck. And we're going to keep following you, your career and, and other things. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, you guys. And stay safe and stay healthy and enjoy that beautiful Hawaiian weather. I'm super <laughs> jealous, for sure. Well, we look forward to seeing you out perform out here one day or just vacation. Well, thank you again. Good luck to you and congratulations on Thanks, all your success. Guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Have a good one. Right. Thank <laughs> you.